So this mini lecture is um, going to be looking at anticoagulation, specifically in the context of treating atrial fibrillation. So uh, there's a little bit of a physiology review here. Um, I'm going to go over some of these concepts just to review some of these um, major points that kind of put things into perspective from the pharmacology angle. Um, and so basically what we're looking at is we're looking at the counter balance between hemostasis and the production of clots. And essentially what happens is, <coughs> excuse me, is that um, there, there gets, um, there, there has to be some type of um, inflammatory event that essentially produces these clots. And in some cases, this inflammatory event um, is obviously normal, uh, but in some cases it becomes pathological. And uh, depending on the size and the severity of this clot, and, and if it actually completely occludes this vessel, um, that's kind of the distinction between, you know, normal physiology and disease. When these when these clots become really, really large, and if they become dislodged, um, that's really kind of setting the stage for pathology. <clears throat> and so central to these clots are platelets, um, also known as thrombocytes. <coughs> Excuse me. And um, they're cell fragments. They're derived from megakaryocytes, and they've got a relatively short half-life. They only live about eight to ten days. And in terms of the platelets, they basically play major roles in the formation of these clots. And so um, and when you talk about the clotting uh, cascade or the clotting process, these platelets can adhere to each other. They can activate um, other platelets and um, and have effects on the endothelium. And of course, they can aggregate. And when they aggregate, that's when these clots get bigger and bigger. And that's when pathology starts to manifest itself. And so central to kind of this inflammatory hypothesis in terms of the vascular uh, system, um, we can revisit a, um, a hypothesis back in uh, the 18th century called Virchow's Triad, uh, which kind of sounds like a Russian mafia organization. Um, but it's really looking at the, the interplay between endothelial cell injury, um, abnormal or, or turbulent blood flow, and this notion of the blood being too thick or hypercoagulated. And of course, within the physiology, there are normal control mechanisms um, that will inhibit the formation of clots. And there are control mechanisms that will favor the formation of clots. Um, depending on what's happening at the local environment and uh, what what overall physiologic effect is needed. Okay. <clears throat> and so the way these thromboses or these clots can form could be physical damage, such as a wound. Um, but for, for this lecture, we're really going to talk about physiological damage or pathophysiology that results in the formation of clots because of hypertension, and this is uncontrolled hypertension, um, turbulent blood flow, um, which is kind of happening within the atria. Those atria are not contracting um, at, the proper, at the proper speed, and um, in many cases are asynchronous. And so you get this kind of pooling or this regurgitation of blood within the atria, and, um, and that basically can form a hypercoagulated state that's really um, able to clot a lot faster than normal. Um, other things, bacterial products, um, cholesterol, toxins, and radiation, these are all things also that can induce the formation of clots. And we'll come back to these concepts throughout the curriculum. In terms of having blood that's essentially too thick, um, these thrombi can form uh, due to inherited reasons. Um, some of the more commonly encountered um, genetic reasons behind um, hypercoagulated states are listed here on the left. Uh, and then they can also be acquired over time. So certain drugs can induce um, a, a hypercoagulated state. Um, autoimmunity uh, to various proteins, autoimmunity to heparin molecules, autoimmunity to certain anti, uh, to certain phospholipids, um, excuse me, can produce these, you know, acquired hypercoagulated states. And so the outcome is the same, blood is too thick. Um, and so central to this blood being too thick are the formation of these thrombi or these, these clots. 
And sometimes these clots can propagate, they can get bigger, sometimes they can move, um, sometimes they can shrink or resolve uh, along, uh, um, by themselves. And in some cases, they can, they can actually become vascularized. And so this is due to essentially um, the inflammatory uh, cells that, that infiltrate these, these clots and actually lay down a vascular network and um, the process of angiogenesis can occur. <coughs> Excuse me. Likewise, um, as these clots move, they become embolic. Um, so an embolism is a, is a solid liquid or a gas, but it's a mass that moves through the, circula through the circulation. And so then therefore, thromboembolism is a clot that has migrated out of the initial site and has moved somewhere else. And so um, atrial fibrillation can produce um, thromboemboli um, that can move throughout the systemic vascular um, network. Pulmonary embolisms are typically caused by deep vein thromboses, and these typically occur in the lower level, the lower, lower leg extremities, and break off and migrate into the lung compartment. Okay, and so in terms of um, pharmacology, you know, we're going to treat uh, all of these coagulation disorders um, with with the drugs that we're going to discuss. And so, what is coagulation? It's really that's the change in the properties of blood. And so we're talking about the physical properties of blood changing from a liquid phase to a gel or a clot-like um, uh, visco vis viscous type um, uh, material. And so anticoagulation therapy or anticoagulation measures will keep blood in this liquid phase um, so that these clots do not um, get bigger and cause pathology. And so if these clots travel um, in the coronary circuit, you can produce a myocardial infarct. If they travel into the um, cerebral circuit, they can produce a transient ischemic attack or a stroke. Um, and so these, you know, these, these clots are definitely problematic. And really, <coughs> excuse me, the, the main therapeutic approach to managing these patients with atrial fibrillation is to prevent these clots from forming. All right. And so the coagulation cascade is really uh, complicated when you first learned it. It actually makes more sense when you apply the drugs to it. So I think in this um, new curriculum, it might actually be a little bit easier. I don't know. We'll find out. Um, I do want you to realize that when you're looking at the coagulation cascade, and here's this is just an excerpt from one of the um, one of the pathways. Essentially, you have <clears throat> Roman numeral uh, whatever, and then it gets converted into Roman numeral A. And so A is active. And so, you know, this is an example. So, so prothrombin is Roman numeral uh, factor two. And then thrombin, which is biologically active, is factor 2A. And so the reason, the way in which prothrombin gets activated to thrombin is through another factor. And so typically in the coagulation cascade, one factor activates the other. And that's why it's a cascade. <coughs> and so like any other biochemical pathway, you need an enzyme, uh, you need a substrate, and you need a cofactor. And these three different um, ingredients, so to speak, will basically produce this um, coagulation cascade, which basically uh, produces um, all of these uh, prothrombotic type factors. And so thrombin is essentially um, the, the central key player to, to this whole cascade. And so this really just kind of, kind of shows you the machine where one activated factor activates the second factor, and then that activated factor activates the third factor, and so on and so forth. So this is what that coagulation cascade pathway looks like. Um, you can further subdivide um, the different components to the pathway into the, ex, uh, into the intrinsic and the extrinsic, as well as the common pathway. And so just some kind of unique um, attributes about these different pathways. The extrinsic um, pathway is, you know, the tissue factors are essentially um, generated uh, outside of the circulatory system, okay? The intrinsic pathway, these factors um, get basically um, activated or, or exposed to negatively charged uh, molecules, which could be, you know, bacteria, proteins, or enzymes, uh, glass, um, foreign substances. Um, and then this instigates a specific cascade of, of, of the following factors listed here. <coughs> but central to the coagulation cascade, um, is factor 10, Roman numeral um, 10, which is shown here um, with an X, because factor 10 actually 
is the only factor okay, that actually activates prothrombin into thrombin. And once this thrombin molecule or, or factor becomes biologically active, thrombin can actually activate the pathway in, in at least three different other sites. And so here you see this blue box thrombin. This is active thrombin activating factor 11, factor 8, as well as factor 5. Okay, and so factor 10, which, um, which is shown here in the center, and thrombin, which is also known as factor 2, are really kind of the key players and, of course, make um, our first pharmacologic drug target that we'll discuss in a couple of moments. <clears throat> Sorry. <clears throat> you know, and so um, there's lots of different um, outcomes to this coagulation cascade. Um, and a few of them are highlighted in, in red um, on, the, on the next slide. Um, we've got antithrombins, okay, which actually reduce the activity of thrombin and some other factors. We've got proteins C and S, which are also kind of your vitamin K dependent factors that inactivate um, several other coagulation fact factors. And your tissue factor pathway inhibitor, TFPI. <clears throat> You know, and so there are built-in control mechanisms that restrict or inhibit the coagulation cascade. Um, and so what we also can do from a pharmacologic standpoint is um, utilize those same concepts and, and have drugs that can mimic these effects. And this is clinically significant, as you'll see um, in the latter part of this lecture. Okay, and so the drugs, or the, I'm sorry, the, the factors and the proteins that, that restrict the coagulation cascade, so they would inhibit the cascade that was pictured here, um, are shown here. And so the, the main ones really are antithrombin as well as proteins C and S. Um, and so these are the ones that actually have a, a kind of a well-defined um, pharmacologic um, uh, mechanism um, that we're going to discuss in a lot more detail excuse me, in the next um, in the next aspect of this lecture. Okay, so that was kind of a quick 10 or 12 minute overview of the physiology of coagulation. Let's go now into the pharmacology. <clears throat> okay, <clears throat> so there's, there's several drug classes, <clears throat> excuse me, that affect the coagulation cascade pathway. Um, and so what we're going to do is we're going to focus on these these four for this um, Ruth Barzich case. Um, we're going to talk about heparin molecules as well as heparin-like molecules or synthetic heparin molecules. Uh, we'll talk about vitamin